from the um, from the business of advertising uh, uh, to the business of uh, telecommunications. And for those uh, of you that weren't with us yesterday, we had this is the second day of our of our conference. We were speaking specifically yesterday uh, about telecommunications, uh, and we had with us uh, a number of people who I'd I'd like to uh, uh, to welcome. To the stage now, uh, we had uh, Ronan Dunn uh, from O2, uh, famously a business that has delivered uh, exemplary customer service and grown through advocacy in the UK. Ronan, please come in and join us uh, on the sofa. And uh, Joe Natale, for those of you, as I mentioned at the beginning, that don't know this business, tell us is the most recommended uh, brand uh, in North America. Um, it has uh, tiny levels of customer churn, huge levels of customer satisfaction, something, a journey that that brand has been on over a number of years to get to this uh, stage. Ah, oh, and this is perfect timing. Uh, uh, so, Joe, please join us uh, on the stage. And uh, last but not least, and just in time, um, <laughs> Uh, Dido Baroness uh, Harding, uh, shall I call her, um, uh, who has um, been at the helm of Talk Talk uh, for the last four years and taken a brand that had some challenges uh, on the customer advocacy front uh, and turned that around to a business that now has a 19% uh, market share in the UK, which is pretty extraordinary for a brand uh, that's only been around a few years. Um, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for, for joining us. We had a, a very healthy uh, discussion yesterday about telco, but I think specifically um, I'd like to talk today about advocacy. And you're all running very large scale, as we were just talking about with Martin, mature businesses. Um, to what extent do you think the future of your businesses are about finding new customers? And Martin was alluding to trial, which I think is more of an FMCG kind of uh, driver versus taking better care of the ones you have. Joe, I mean, for example, you have a significant proportion of the households in Canada. To what extent is the future of your business about taking great care of them and to what extent is it about finding new customers? I think it varies a lot by the segment of our business. Uh, generally speaking, I would say that it's always easier and more uh, effective to keep the customer you already have uh, versus spending a lot of money to get a new one. Um, and in a world where we keep creating new solutions, innovations, and ideas, there's an opportunity to increase uh, the penetration of the customer base we have with ideas and solutions as opposed to you know, the madness of the churn impact of recycling and getting new customers on a regular basis. So uh, I would say if you look at TELUS and, and ask anyone within the TELUS organization what is the most important metric that we focus on as a company, uh, I would say it's loyalty above all else. Uh, it is the magic drug of our business. And with that, it leads to all good things culturally, financially, and operationally. And that was a, a very important uh, move that we made uh, as an organization. You know, we... we um, we decided back in 2008, we were about to make a massive investment in a brand new network. We were making the move from CDMA to uh, HSPA, uh, a move that had been contemplated for a year or two, uh, an investment worth billions of dollars. I mean, Canada is a very big and wide country. It really meant swapping out all the gear on some 6,000 towers across the country and all kinds of infrastructure uh, related to it. <laughs> And we said, we, it just can't be about technology. It just can't be about this new network technology. It has to be about you know, breaking from the pack with respect to our capability and reputation in the marketplace. And with that came this focus on loyalty and came a focus on recommendation as being the number one metric within the company. And Dido, let me turn to you. 
I'm in love with my new telco friend. Here. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the sense that um, we had a great conversation last night um, together about how fundamentally um, most telcos are not very customer centric. And right. once you take the leap to be customer focused, there is only one answer. And it's the answer that Joe's just given which is you know, reducing churn, having more loyal customers who want to buy more products and services from you because they really love what they get from you is the answer to being a successful customer-centric telco. Mm -hmm. um, I think Telus is considerably further along that journey than TalkTalk Talk is. Um, you know, w when you were making those decisions in 2009, 2010, TalkTalk Talk was, was nothing short of chaotic, mm -hmm. having grown so fast um, or organically and by acquisition. And I think we are only now really coming to terms with what putting our existing customers first really means in terms of really focusing on improving our customers' experience at, at the expense of other things, genuinely not doing other stuff in order to focus on right. doing what's right for our customers. And it was really inspiring talking to, to, to you and your team last night. Um, there's one and, and it's not a but, I would add on, which is particularly for us as a value for money provider. Um, there is a group of, 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 of households and um, people in the country that we feel very close to who are new customers coming to us, who are people who currently don't have digital skills and are not online. So it's an extraordinary market, the telco market, in that we are, in one way, uh, an essential utility with a lot of the advantages that that brings in terms of a stable customer base and, and, and subscription businesses. But on the other hand, there are still, in the UK, six and a half million households that don't have a broadband connection and a roughly similar number of adults in the UK who have never used the internet on anything, on any device in any way, shape or form. So being the natural home for those people as they start their digital journey is something that we also care a lot about. And we would take a disproportionate share of people new to the internet. It doesn't, by the way, change the fundamental first premise. Is if their first step into the digital world is disastrous because talk, talk, cocks it up, that's a really bad place for us to be. So getting that jo joining journey, particularly for a lot of some of the most sort of disadvantaged in society. Um, and that's non-trivial mm -hmm. because they will genuinely not have any of the basic digital skills. So when you sit in the call centre and you list, sit beside a fantastically patient, often Indian call centre agent, trying to explain to my dad, basically, where the start button is on his computer <laughs> in order to be able to start to try and diagnose why his email doesn't work. And that conversation mm -hmm. takes 45 minutes and you're tearing your hair out, and the, yet the agent is calmly and patiently mm -hmm. trying to work that through the customer. You think you know, there has to be a better way to help these, mm -hmm. these customers, mm -hmm. but my goodness, it's really important that we do. So I'd look at it those two ways. Yeah. Ronan, look, this, this uh, last 10 days uh, has been quite eventful for you. Uh, and somebody's come along and offered an extraordinary amount of money for your company, to what extent would you put that down to the fact that your company has been built on a terrific level of, of customer advocacy, both through very strong levels of customer service, which I think you've enjoyed class leading customer service for many years, as we discussed yesterday, but also a very distinctive uh, loyalty scheme in priority that, that you know is largely, I suppose, in, in the context of today's Conversation. One of the best examples of of advocacy as a as a, as an advertising as a, as a lead advertising vehicle. <clears throat> Look, I think there's no doubt that um, the reputation that uh, O2 has earned from its customer centricity has been an integral part in driving the inherent value in the in the business. But I think. Advocacy has a number of parts, and I think we need to be careful. If you look at it simply as a financial driver, we all talk about churn. It's the single biggest variable in our uh, cost base. It's the cost of not acquiring but then retaining customers. But in many respects, advocacy is, you know, we have those brand ambassadors, we have our fans. But the way you can drive the most value, bizarrely, in your business is by turning the rebels inside your uh, base into inerts. That in itself is the most valuable. Actually turning a, an inert into a fan doesn't give you as big an increment of value add as turning the rebel in, because tenure is the single biggest driver of value in our business. And sometimes when we talk about the advocacy, what we want to do is just add more 
um, surprise and delight moments for people who already get it and already love it. So I think when we talk about advocacy, we also need to make sure that we focus very, very hard on the rebels that are in, um, in your base. And one of the things that we did early on, um, and it's interesting, there's still advertising being done in the UK on this same subject as if it was some novel idea. We have never offered new customers a better deal than our existing customers. It's called fair deal, we simply don't do it. Well, guess what? The base, the start point of any advocacy is if you've already acquired the customer, presuming that you're going to offer somebody else who's no, not even an existing customer, who's never shown any loyalty to the brand, something better, just undermines. And I know sometimes when in the market where you're trying to grow share and whatever else, that can be a challenge. So we started on a premise that said, once we'd acquired a customer, they were never ever going to be uh, made second class citizens relative to anyone else in the, uh, in the market. And now one of the things that we focus more and more on is we have identified ways to surprise and delight customers with things like our guru program with innovations in tariffing like refresh with priority. But more and more we're doing things like, I'll give you a good example of turning rebels into fans. We have a base of customers who have an iPhone 5. Well, through a complex um, rationale of the regulator, if you were on O2 and you bought an iPhone 5, you couldn't get 4G on that device. If you were on EE and you had an iPhone 5, you could. It wasn't our decision. It was one of these anomalies of the way spectrum regulation was done. So we have a whole lot of customers who are pissed off with us because on the face of it, somebody else with the same phone can get a service that we can't. So one of the things that we've been doing is going out and specifically going to those iPhone 5 customers with refresh and saying, here's an opportunity for you to upgrade early so that you can get out of that uh, trap that was, you, you were forced into by someone else. And by doing that, actually acknowledging there's an issue in the first place, not blaming the regulator, but pri providing a solution. Because those customers, those iPhone 5 customers, are actually some of our least satisfied customers because they're just pissed at the fact that the device doesn't do something on our network. There are only two networks in Europe that can run an iPhone 5 on 4G. Only two in the whole of Europe out of 140 licensed operators. But as a good example of, I could be really pissed with the regulator or I could sort my shit out internally and do something about it and create an opportunity for advocacy inside. And I think that's where we need to make sure that the advocacy thing doesn't run away with being nice to the people who already believe you're nice guys, but actually getting to the heart of the people in your business who are hacked off with you for some reason, mm -hmm. valid or otherwise, because actually there's more value in retaining them than there is in simply spending more on the people who are staying anyway. Let me talk a bit about being nice to customers, because in all parts of the world, we discussed this yesterday, telco is, uh, and telco spend is, a, is, a, is a, an increasing and a large uh, part of consumers spend. And I guess to an extent, the question then is, of course you have to take good care of your customers in terms of customer service and getting them on the networks that they want to be on and, and, and fixing complaints and et cetera. But to what extent do you guys feel running the size of companies that you're now running, you also need to make a contribution beyond just to the individual customers, but to the communities in which you uh, operate in the countries in which we operate, because they're now such. You're now such a big part of of consumers' lives. I mean, Joe, I, I might ask you to start because sure. give where you live, which is probably something that people here don't know about, uh, has been a big part of of what you guys have been doing. So we we said at Talos quite a few years ago that um, uh, we had to really define the context of why we're here. It's not just about the money mm -hmm. and about profitability. And we said to ourselves that you know, our goal ultimately was to improve the lives of Canadians and lives in communities. And I know a lot of companies say things like that, because it sounds great. Uh, but if you want to have the cultural impact, if you want to motivate 44,000 people to be focused in that manner and live that brand, uh, you have to make it very real for them. And what we did is, is we created this uh, movement that we called We Give Where We Live. And the premise of We Give Where We Live is very simply that if uh, you do well in business, you have an obligation to do good in the communities where we live, work, and serve, is the way we, we, we kind of typified our sentiment. 
Um, and that spawned a whole bunch of different things, creative things that came from our teams. Um, one is we initiated um, an annual Tell Us Day of Giving. And it's one day a year where we collect every Tell Us team member, their friends, their families, their dogs, their neighbors, whoever wants to come and uh, across the country, and Canada is a massive country, as you know, they're across five time zones. Uh, we will have a few hundred different places where they can go and spend a day uh, in a shelter, uh, in a food bank, uh, in a help center, in a youth advocacy center, and, spend, and do meaningful work, uh, not just for that day, but to create a relationship in their community that goes on beyond that day. The premise of the thought is that we, as human beings, all have a desire to give. Uh, a lot of us don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. We need to be kind of brought to a situation where you can give of yourself. And we found this incredible outpouring that came from this Day of Giving. Uh, last year, uh, this will be our 10th anniversary of the Day of Giving. Last year, we had 15,000 people that came out for one day. Uh, and um, if you look at our you know, volunteer hours, uh, it's measured in the millions each year in terms of volunteer hours. Uh, we draw some contrast and comparison. We're about one-tenth the size of Verizon, but our volunteer hours are as big as Verizon's in terms of what it means to us as an organization and a company as a whole. We pioneered this idea of community boards. Um, so we now have about 11 different community boards across Canada. They sit in specific communities and um, we populate them with a combination of local citizens that are part of the community. They could be in, in government, they could be uh, in business, they could be uh, in uh, social assistance somehow. And they're part of this community board with a couple of our team members. And we give them money each year. And it's, think of it as an angel fund. An angel fund for charities and charitable ideas that don't have any oxygen. And the large charitable foundations do a good job of giving money to well-established charities. But the new uh, ideas out there that are meant to do good in the community uh, often have a hard time finding funding, finding support, finding skills to support them. And these community boards now have taken on a life of their own. Um, and the work that they're doing is, is incredible. Um, when you ask people the question, why tell us, uh, our status in the community is a big, big piece of, of our success. Um, we were named a few years ago uh, the most philanthropic corporation in the world by the Association of Fundraising Professionals based on the work that we're doing holistically. I could go on about mm -hmm. other things that we're doing, but in the realm, these are a few of the kind of more relevant uh, examples as a whole. And the most important factor is um, it lights up the soul of our organization. When I spend time with our frontline team members and I talk about customer advocacy, I talk about likelihood to recommend being the number one thing that we're mm -hmm. focused on, because we said a long time ago that it's not about customer service. Mm -hmm. Customer service is table stakes. There are satisfied customers that leave you all the time. If you can move a customer from being satisfied to recommending, they've made an emotional shift. They're willing to stand up and stake their reputation on you as a provider. And, you know, it's, and like anything else, I could say, Johnny, you recommend a great restaurant in Soho. Yeah. If I go have dinner it's, and it's crap, I'm going to turn to you and say, Johnny, what was <laughs> that all about? So the, it changes the dialogue when you get into the recommendation sphere. And, and we can't possibly help have our team members you know, be advocates if there's not more to the job than just plugging in and out, day in and day out, running mm -hmm. the business. And I would say that in terms of cultural impact between the, the customer's first revolution that we've alluded to and our work in the community, that's been sort of the double barrel of success within the culture of the organization. Let me just turn to you, Dade. The, the We're talking a bit about organizations that got to table stakes and then have been in the position to be able to do the wonderful thing that, that Joe's talked about. When you first arrived at Talk Talk, you found a, as you, in your own words, <laughs> it's quite a chaotic situation. How do you deal with that and where do you start where you find that you've got customers who are in a very different place to those that, that Joe's describing at TELUS? Um, I think, well, two things. I, I, I don't think that you can just, I, I'm going to be dangerously in agreement with Joe, you can't just focus on the service issues. Mm -hmm. You have actually got to give your people, first of all, your most important first advocates or your own people, a purpose beyond... Um, business, a mm -hmm. purpose beyond price, mm -hmm. a purpose beyond making money. 
Um, so clearly, um, Talk Talk 2010, when I, I, I arrived, we had a huge amount of work to do on improving the fundamental customer experience. But we didn't do that on its own. We, we started, if I think the journey, we started by actually saying, what do we want to stand for as a business? Mm -hmm. you know, so if you think back and say, you know, what are the sort of ingredients? I think you've got to have a core purpose that is beyond just being cheap, if you're yep. a value for money provider. Um, and you've got to have a set of core values that go beyond making money. Yep. So I'm one of our, ba we call them our basics because we don't want to be like any other company that they were just values on a poster. Um, one of our basics is it's not just about the money. Um, and so if you look at our journey, and I'll talk in a sec about the customer service piece because that's absolutely fundamental, mm -hmm. but I would think uh, our, our work on child internet safety and the launch of HomeSafe and pioneering, driving that through for the whole industry is every bit as important in our journey to being viewed as a reputable, reliable business mm -hmm. as I wouldn't go as far as saying loved at all yet, yep. um, as the journey we, we went through in actually making sure that it did just work. So it, it had to be both. You know, I remember one of my very first meetings with my top 100, who, by the way, didn't even know each other, had to be introduced um, it, it, five years ago, where I asked the show of hands, who's a Talk Talk customer in the room? And almost nobody was. And so you know, that beginning of saying, we have to eat our own cooking. Um, and then when we gave free Talk Talk phone and broadband to everybody, the next month there was a great barrage of complaints that they had to call the call center. So that is the point. <laughs> <You know? laughs> to actually eat our own cooking. Um, so there was a huge amount that we had to do first to get our people to believe that we were worth it. And, and so a purpose beyond price for us, internet safety, digital inclusion, has been a really important part of the journey. And then, the, so that's the good bit. And then the sort of the customer service piece is about really holding the mirror up and feeling it. And so that's eating your own cooking. Yeah. So you realize it doesn't work. Um, spending time, I think one of the challenges in telcos is that it's quite hard to actually get to the customer mm -hmm. in compared to my past life in retailing where mm -hmm. you just you know, frog march everyone out of the, the office and into the shop on the first day. Um, you know, bringing the customer to people and getting them, it's really hard. So I've done a lot of um, taking people overseas who'd never been, you know, the chap at the time five years ago who was responsible for our outsource call centre said didn't like travelling very much and hadn't actually been to some of them. Um, <laughs> I got there before he did. <laughs> and, you know, whereas now our culture is, you know, we, we have telepresence everywhere. I did a, 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 what we call them listen, listen sessions instead of focus groups with a group of Indian agents last week um, who were absolutely brilliant and don't hesitate. And I know a lot of them personally will tell me what they think. I read customer emails every day and a lot of the senior management read them every day with me. And you know, they're awful. And you know, you sort of, I view them as like doing my daily prayers. I often uh, read them at the end of the day on the, w uh, on the way home, I did last night. And you know, it's not that I can personally fix every single one, but I can, I, I can sort of drive from the very top down the fact that if I can be bothered to listen to what we've done horribly to customers today, everyone else can in the organisation. And step by step by step, now clearly there's a lot of structured process improvement that we've done and much, much more that we need to do. But I think that personal advocacy yeah. Um, that comes from the top and you know, getting everyone in the business to genuinely eat their own cooking and believe that this is a business that cares and wants to do more than just make money has been a, an integral part of our time. I think around. that's a, a marked similarity actually from our discussions yesterday between the, the three of you. Yeah. Is that when you were talking yesterday about it, Ron, that you read every piece of, of uh, customer feedback, yeah. uh, uh, feedback? And I suppose if the advocacy can't start from the very top, then, then one shouldn't expect to see it, you know, co coming through the rest of the business. Can There's an old uh, Italian expression, Johnny, that says that the fish rots from the head. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. And I think it, the onus is on us as leaders to lead by example. Did you, you write that one down, Gideon? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, well, Johnny, just, just building and not to repeat what's been said, because I would agree with all of it, uh, I think three things I would highlight is, uh, as Dida pointed out, Advocacy starts inside your organization, and you have to be proud of the products and services as well as then building to say proud of who we stand for as an organization. Second thing I would say, which is really important, both within our customer bases and within our employee bases, is millennials or screenagers have a different attitude to the balance of doing well and doing good. 
People of my generation believed you do well first and then you focus on doing good later in your career. Younger generation are very, very clear that doing well and doing good are not mutually exclusive. You do them in parallel rather than sequentially. We need to tap into that within our organizations, both internally and with our customer base. At the moment, we have more than 70% participation in volunteering within our uh, employee base uh, in the UK. And we started in a very similar place to Joe's. We had a program called It's Your Community, which was very similar to Give Where You Live. And one of the things about advocacy is that we developed from that a program which some of you hopefully are familiar with, which is uh, Think Big, Big, which combines our, our people agenda and our planet and environmental and sustainability agenda, because we don't believe they're two mutually exclusive causes. They're integral uh, to each other. But that allowed us to be more structured, national, still allowing all the local community engagement, but, but create, creating a structure that was easier to leverage to scale, to influence other corporates to behave. Because my third piece is, and forgive me, but people of my generation of leadership have fundamentally failed in that the corporate private sector has not delivered its contribution in society over the last 10 years. We have been found out as a generation of leaders, as a generation of corporates. That's simply unacceptable. So we have to make sure that what we do, and those of us who do get it, need to hold ourselves to account to influence others. And one of the things I'm more and more convinced about is that using <clears throat> the power of brand as a convening force for the power of good within private sector businesses. And without a hint of arrogance, because we serve 24 million customers every single day under a single brand, which is more unique than Coca-Cola sell, which is more than any bank, any high street retailer, any anyone. Believe it or not, if I ring up or ask, people will see me at chairman level, at prime minister level. We've just been awarded a citizenship award for our Think Big program by the prime minister in the last few days. And that's nothing to do, in my view, ultimately about O2, but it's the responsibility that we have as a business to leverage that influence, to draw others together. So I sit as a trustee on one group called Step Up to Serve, which is about youth engagement and, and increasing youth social action. And it's one that's supported by all the political parties in the UK, and our patron is the, is the Prince of Wales. But by us taking a lead and saying we would be the corporate ambassador, we now have 15 large corporates who are participating in that. And in a small way, the fact that somebody like O2 stood up, put their name to it, and I personally committed to be both a trustee and an ambassador, allowed us to leverage that to move things forward. So it's not about us, but it's about the fact that I think corporate Britain, and I suspect corporate globally, has a lot of catching up to do to deliver on 10 years of abject failure on our part. And, and, and let me pick you up on that then, because, because you're all such big and important businesses within the communities you operate in, governments are very interested in, in what you're doing. Um, Dido, in that sense, you're <laughs> on both sides of that fence, because you're also <laughs> in one. But what, if, you're, so if your advocacy-driving initiatives are things that you want to do because they're the right thing to do for your customers, and that's one half the equation, another big part of the challenges all three of you face, I think, is government and regulation. How do you deal with, for example, Joe, in Canada, you would have a government that probably enjoys the fact that the telco sector is much criticised, uh, makes political capital out of that, and yet you have class-leading customer service, but if I'm in government, it's probably easier to lump you in with uh, the sector than to single you out. How do you, how do you cope with that challenge? I, I think, first of all, it's fair to say that in, in Canada, if you go back six or seven years and were to survey Canadians and ask them the question, uh, do you hate your telecoms provider? Do you truly despise your <laughs> telecoms provider? Or do you think they're the devil incarnate? <laughs> they would probably choose a third option. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, you wind up getting the consumer sentiment and therefore populist government sentiment that you deserve. 
And as an industry, we had a horrible reputation. Um, for us at Talos, it created an impetus. It created this incredible opportunity. Uh, I mentioned we made this network investment. And I said, it can't just be about technology because we'll be fastest today and then not tomorrow, most reliable today and then not tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The technology is forever moving, changing. Um, you know, we were in a place where, where um, our competitor uh, was on GSM and therefore had exclusivity around the iPhone. We spent our time apologizing to customers for not mm -hmm. having the latest handsets. Uh, we couldn't get the latest BlackBerry when BlackBerry mattered more than it does today. And, you know, it, it created this sort of catalytic moment in the organization that said, look, consumers despise us. We're going to make this multi-billion dollar investment. Mm -hmm. We've got to take this opportunity to kind of change the game. And uh, I think it was actually a blessing from that perspective because we went after all the hygiene factors. We talked yesterday, Ronan, about hygiene factors. Went after all the hygiene factors, went after the cultural transformation, and went after sort of the, 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 the emotional soul of the organization to kind of get to where we are today. And we're not done. We, 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 I refuse to declare victory. Mm -hmm. In fact, I will never declare victory <laughs> in terms of that particular movement or, or moment. Um, and you know what's happened is that the government uh, uh, has taken notice that you know, outside the rhetoric that we sometimes read in the newspapers, uh, they'll pull us aside and say, you are different. You are different. Uh, and we agree that we're actually fundamentally aligned. We believe that customer service is paramount. Uh, we believe that we must invest for the future of the digital age because uh, to the comment you made yesterday, the, the, the phone in my pocket is now the remote control for my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and as, as a result, uh, we are actually you know, conspirators in bringing to life this capability. Um, and we recognize that outside of that, they have a job to do. Um, and if they could disproportionately impact my competitors, I'm very happy with that. Let me ask you, Dido, yesterday, you didn't say this, but Claire Enders did. Uh, she said she thought uh, BT was trying to get, essentially trying to get its monopoly back. How do you deal with that challenge if you agree that that <laughs> is what BT are trying to do and what role do you think uh, well both government and I suppose Europe uh, presents in terms of the, the challenges you face? Well I mean, our single largest competitor is our single largest supplier BT um, and yes I do think they're doing a pretty decent job at recreating the institution that was the pre-privatised BT. Um, and um, for all three of us, managing regulation and ensuring a sort of level playing field of sort of competition is, is integral to your job of running a telco. Um, so I've been very public about the fact that we think that BT should be broken up um, mm -hmm. and that we think that um, that will create a better Britain, not just a better competitive landscape. Um, and it's a very large part of my job as the CEO. Um, perversely, if you think of everything else we've been talking about, my job on regulation is to focus a lot on it personally and make sure that my company doesn't. Because mm -hmm. everyone else, other than possibly about three of us in the company, need to be focused on the stuff we've just been talking about, doing a better job for our existing customers. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that regulatory landscape is existentially important to a challenger um, disruptor like TalkTalk. Talk. Um, partly just because of our physical model that we use BT's infrastructure, but also not just in the infrastructure, in every other way, when you have very large incumbents who, I think it was Nicholas Shenstrom at, um, who said this, um, founded Skype, that monopolies are like children. Until you have one, you don't understand how wonderful they are. But once you have one of your own, you will protect it with your life. Um, and, and it's true. It's not that BT are wicked and evil. They're rational. Mm -hmm. They've got a monopoly. They will do everything in their power to protect it. Of course they will. And therefore, you need to have um, a regulator that is firmly on the pitch, making sure that consumers, businesses get a fair deal. And so, you know, my job is to be, in, in, as much as anything, an advocate for that change for the country, not just an advocate for talk, talk, self-interest, mm -hmm. because the regulator will see through that in a heartbeat, mm -hmm. as will every politician. Because in the end, you can be really, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously incredibly sort of populist to knock all politicians, but what politicians will ultimately do is they will listen to their constituencies. Mm -hmm. 
They will listen really hard to what people say, and they will be deeply suspicious of vested interests. So to be a credible challenger that Britain needs a better telecom structure, which I really firmly do, mm -hmm. I have to start from what's right for Britain rather than just what's right for Tortall. Ronan, let me, just, let me just give you a specific question, which is, it's possible that the uh, deal that you guys have done could take between 12 and 15 months to come to pass. Uh, and, of course, when that happens, there's always a possibility the thing doesn't come to pass, and I'd like your, your opinion on whether it will or not. But to Dido's point also about it being the CEO's job to manage the regulation but keep the rest of the business running, how are you going to cope with that challenge over the next 15 months, which is to keep your business focused on taking care of its customers and building its advocacy, whilst you've got speculation and conversation and yeah. Mandarin lessons to be taking? It's, a, it's a, a, a great question, and um, in a, another forum, uh, I did share that I thought probably the biggest leadership challenge I've had in my 30-year uh, uh, business career. I think there are two key things, and it builds on a point that Dido made, is um, the role of a leader is to lead. And in doing that, it's to liberate everybody else in the organization to be the success that they deserve to be and are capable of being. And the stuff that leaders are responsible for is the stuff that nobody else in the organization should be having to worry about. That's the purpose of being at the top of the, the tree. What I've said to all of my colleagues is, during this period of uncertainty, what would be the best possible outcome at the end of that period, whether it's three months, 12 months, or 15 months. And when you talk about it, it's very simple. It's execute the strategy we already have, which is put the customer first, make sure that no matter what happens over the next 12 or 15 months, nobody but nobody can ignore O2. They haven't done for years, why should they do now? If we create an environment in which our customers, and we've talked, Nina, my marketing director is here, talked about a rededication to our customers because actually the bond that we have in our organization is such that there is a trinity of the brand, the customer, and the colleague that is so strong that if we do the right thing for our customers, it puts all of our colleagues in the best possible situation for the day when the deal closes and somebody says, who are the best people in this organization to now lead a 33 million customer champion business led with, through mobility. So actually what we've reassured colleagues is, of course there's uncertainty, but guess what? With 33 million customers, probably 95% of the people in the organization will have an opportunity going forward if they choose it. The one thing's for certain is you don't need two CEOs, but pretty much everything else <laughs> is, up, is up for grabs. So I think that's yeah. really important. The other thing which uh, is important is the regulatory uncertainty in the environment is something that most of the people in the business don't worry about. So to the question of will it go through, of course it'll go through, it's just a question of when. What I have to make sure is that I'm supporting that, of course it will go through to the process. And that's where this understanding of what's good for Britain, what's the outcome for the country is really important. Because for years, in my view, the industry has served itself poorly by allowing politicians and regulators to say, one of you is as bad as the next, we don't trust any of you, and we just play one off against the other. We engaged in rhetoric, we never engaged in dialogue. When I took over seven and a half years ago, it literally was, you know, where's the next opportunity to sue the regulator? And I took, after a year or two to get into my uh, role and really understand it, I took a different view and I said, right, I'm going to step back and now I'm going to take, not a statesman's position, but take a position which is, what would the customer outcome be that would be the best, which is a proxy for what's the right answer for UK PLC, and started to advocate quietly, both with other CEOs, and I'm now the longest serving CEO in the telco sector, fixed mobile, or any variant thereof at this stage, and I've even um, outlasted Ed Richards at Ofcom, <laughs> so I am the last man standing uh, in the process. And I think we've moved a substantial degree, and I think with Sharon White coming in at uh, Ofcom and post an election, whatever happens, I think there's an opportunity for us to have a fresh approach 
and to just really build on what's the right thing for UK PLC and make sure that we all understand our role in it. And that probably will mean changes in the structure at BT, but it should also mean that a strong mobile-led champion in a market that's becoming ever more integrated is part of how we have a real choice for customers. Let me, I know we're probably starting to run a bit late, but I'm going to take a question or two. Just at the back of the room there. You, you started off talking very much about loyalty and how loyalty comes from customer service, and then you talked about it being more than customer service, it's advocacy. And Ronan, you talked about surprise and delight. Um, as a customer, sort of a get, you the man get me the manager sort of guy that I'm afraid I am, um, if I was to observe the biggest thing that makes me an advocate of how I get loyal customer service and makes me loyal is the empowerment of staff. Yeah. The biggest difference between any company or not is if the person I'm talking to you feel is empowered and tries to solve the problem and surprise and delight. Just a quick analogy, I, I'm one of my main businesses is an insurance business. Um, I had two claims going on at the same time, both thefts from trains, one for my daughter, one for me. One dragged on for six months of a nightmare. One, the money was paid that day by the first person I talked to into my bank account. I have told 100, 200 people of that company and the other one I've also slagged off. So there's <laughs> advocacy. So how have, have do you recognize empowerment? How have you managed to be able to crack it? Because I think it's the biggest single thing against, either for or against advocacy is empowerment. So maybe I'll start, and others I'm sure will think it's, I think before you get to empowerment, there's enablement. And uh, without trying to nuance words, um, the hygiene factors, the capability inside the organization, because you can have all the empowerment in the world, and if the systems, processes, and other things don't support being able to deliver, then what you do is create um, an even worse position. So I think you have to build on enablement first, and then build <clears throat> empowerment on top of that. So you've given people the tools for the job. What you've also done is given them the confidence that if they take ownership of something, that they have the wherewithal for it to be solved. The worst possible thing is to put your frontline troops in a position where actually you're not right behind them to support them, but you're expecting them every day to be advocates of the brand. So I think it's both. And what we tried to do is when we first moved from BT Salnet to O2, we built a thing called a customer promise and a customer plan. We took 250 million pounds out of cost in other places and put it into the front line and into the simplification of processes and the improvement of tools for the job. In doing that, we created great internal advocacy because people saw that the money and the investment and the decisions we were making were supporting them to support customers. And they saw themselves as being seen as customer champions. When you do that, you then create the empowerment that allows people to do the right thing because they want to take ownership because they believe they can get it right on behalf of the customer. Maybe I agree with everything that, that Ronan said. Um, one other piece, one of the most powerful ways that we can empower our customers is to let them do it themselves. So uh, the more that, that our customers can self-serve, can solve their own problems, no one actually wants to call a telco. They, if they're going to make a phone call at all, they'd rather call their friends. Um, and so the more, and what we find is the more people self-serve um, on the journey in, so, um, you know, buy online, buy by mobile, don't talk to a human being from TalkTalk Talk at all when they, when they buy the product, the more comfortable they are going to be serving themselves as they go through, and actually the more they trust us. And so there's a, the, the part of our journey is actually to try wherever possible to enable the customer to be empowered to solve themselves solve their own problem, upsell themselves, deal with their own bill, bill query, and to not force them to have to have that conversation that they didn't want to have in the first place. And then that reduces the, the number of things that you're asking. These are made, the people, when you have a, a, a problem where you feel as the customer that the agent you're speaking to isn't empowered to, to solve the problem or isn't treating you well, it is almost never the agent's fault. It is almost always our fault. 
Um, and one of the challenges is that you ask these amazing, and they are amazing and often incredibly well-educated people, um, to do a job that is impossible because it's so broad. You're asking them to have this extraordinary range of knowledge to fix issues and manage um, uh, unconnected systems. So the more you can simplify the systems and processes and the number of reasons why they've got an angry or frustrated customer on the phone, the better chance that these brilliant people will actually be able to do what they always wanted to do in the first place, which is delight you. And you know, the bit I hate hearing in the call centres is when an agent has to say to a customer, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. always a clue that the business is constraining the people from mm -hmm. doing the right thing. Yeah. I'll tell a little story. Um, I agree with the comment around letting people choose the channel they like. Mm -hmm. Because, and pivot between channels. Start mm -hmm. online, I'm stuck on mm -hmm. something, go to chat, go to phone. I mean, it's very important in this world that we, we understand the importance of seamless multi-channel interaction. But I'll tell you a story about um, our journey. You're gonna go back in the time machine to our call center. We have 6,000 people that answer the phone. And the number one metric for the team member on the phone was finish the call, in 600 seconds. I don't care what happens, you have 600 seconds to do great things. <laughs> <laughs> and it's human nature that if I'm on the phone for 800 seconds or 20 minutes because I've had a troublesome call, uh, when the next call comes up, it's human nature to say, I've got to make my number. <laughs> Let's see if I can mm -hmm. shorten this next call. Or maybe I can transfer this next call. Or maybe I can find a way to kind of just give half the answer and move on and maybe <laughs> assuage my conscience that I've done the right thing. Um, and well-intentioned, capable people that you know run businesses, uh, are involved in sports in their communities, do these incredible things in the community, and we treat them like children. And the greatest thing we did is we said, the metric is no longer valid. It's gone. And the only metric is, did you resolve the customer's problem the first time, yeah. right? Yeah. Without any repeat call, without any transfer of a call, it's first time resolution, period. And um, people thought we lost our minds. In the call center doctrine, <laughs> it's, it's you know the first commandment, thou, thou must manage to <laughs> average handle time. <laughs> Uh, and my frontline managers came out to me and said, you've lost your mind, you've opened the bar, wait till you get the tab, uh, <laughs> this is going to go crazy. Um, and fundamentally, I thought, these people uh, do want to do the right thing. Their heart's in the right place, let them do it. Resolve the problem uh, and give them the tools uh, to do just that. And we took the frontline managers who had built their careers uh, sitting in their office, working on special projects, working on a really cool idea, a PowerPoint presentation, and that was sort of the career progression. And we said, you no longer have an office. You're going to sit with your team on the floor, and you're going to coach each one of the people that reports to you for at least an hour or two each week. And they had about 16, 18 people reporting to them. Um, we're going to record every phone call, and we're going to teach you coaching skills. And almost two-thirds of the managers didn't make it. Because they grew up in this neo military world of manage to the number, do special things for my boss, and progress up the chain. So my message is you have to get at the inner workings of the culture of the organization. And, and we all talk about culture. We wave around, we want the greatest mm -hmm. culture, but you can't act on culture directly. You have to act on the elements that represent the culture the measurements, the policies, how people get ahead in the organization, you have to go right at those elements and eradicate them or transform them. And once you do that, you will have created the landscape or the playing field then to really empower the people. Without that, it's just like adding this tangled mess of decision-making authority on top of this broken culture. Uh, when we did that, uh, um, it's amazing. People pulled me aside and said, this is the greatest thing ever. Um, we saw repeats and transfers just fall off a cliff completely. We saw uh, top two box scores from interaction with our call center go through the <laughs> roof. Um, we saw average handle time go up substantially uh, for a short period of time. Yeah. Right? It went up to 800, 800 seconds on average. Mm -hmm. And then we worked through what were the things getting in the way 
tools, processes, support, and now it's come back down. And the calls per, per customer have gone down by some 40% in the last few years. So the, 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 the cost, the investments that Ronan spoke about get paid back multifold because of that emphasis and that focus. But you've got to get at the fabric of the organization. And, and I'm sure in your two insurance examples, uh, the, the contrast was probably very much that. Handcuffing one particular individual based on systems, processes, culture where they couldn't act versus another where you liberate them to do so. I think we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, all three of you. That was very inspiring. Thank you.